Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Welcome to another episode of Upside and Impact Investing for Change, the podcast that I do for the New York Stock Exchange platform, ETFcentral.com. I'm your host of the podcast and CEO of VegTech Invest. I'm live today in Kansas City. Ouch! At 7.30 in the morning central, that would be 5.30 in the morning Pacific time. Okay, I understand that everyone in New York is having coffee right now, but 5.30 in the morning Pacific time is early for me. The only reason I would do a podcast live on camera this early in the morning would be because of my guest today. I'm over the moon to have back with me. She's kind of a regular on this show. Jen Bartashis, senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. She covers big box stores and the food industry, particularly plant-based industry is a sector now that she covers as an analyst. And I wanted to get her feedback from the conference, which is why we're in Kansas City, of farm, food, and fuel. Jen, thanks for being with me. Oh, good morning, Elizabeth. I'm so happy to be here. Amazingly, she doesn't drink coffee, if you can believe it. She's, she's been up and at it for a while. Uh, so here we are, Kansas City together, Farm, Food, and Fuel Conference. I'm wondering if you can, before we dive into specifically food and what you've been talking about therein and what we've been talking about together, if you have any major takeaways from the conference, not specific to food, but just in general of the topic before we dive in. Well, yeah, this is the first conference of this sort for Bloomberg. And one of the things that we really wanted to do was to help fill the gaps between what what happens in one sector and how it impacts others. So showing how things translate from the farm, whether it's nitrogen, fertilizer, into food and the food processing industry and into fuel, and the decisions that are made um, along that decision tree um, is really part of what this conference is all about. So it's been fascinating to see how all of these topics are interrelated um, and that people don't always give enough credit to how much they are dependent upon each other. Mm-hmm. I've heard, listened to some wonderful people. The um, chief of the USDA weather outlook. I didn't even know that the USDA had a weather outlook um, department, and it makes so much sense that they would. So weather being a big part of this conversation, as we are so susceptible to those highs and lows, the vicissitudes of our planet, sustainability, an ongoing theme here, a biofuel and what that looks like, how we can be no, more a natural resource efficient and less intensive. So the planet really, although not said in those terms, the planet ultimately and its natural resources being a big topic of conversation here. Uh, As we dive in specifically to food, that which you and I discuss a lot, before we go into the plant-based innovation sector and the meat sector, we had some interesting conversations with industry leaders here. Uh, Perhaps you can tell me about food in general. You had four major major takeaways in one of the panels that you, one of the presentations that you gave about um, food, packaged food specifically, and where that's going, what to look for. So we're looking at sort of four megatrends um, as we go forward into the next decade. Um, you know, one of those um, is sustainability, which is at front and foremost for, for what we're talking about. Uh, the next is AI and generative AI, um, because you can't really have a conversation without including it these days. Um, then we're also talking about uh, food as medicine and personalized nutrition. And these are all things that are starting to really emerge, but we think are going to heavily influence the food system over the next decade or so. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting is I think those topics are going to influence each other. So I think AI is going to influence personalized nutrition, and I'm really excited for that day when people can, on their own phone, maybe even at home, test their own blood and see like, ah, today I'm short on niacin, which would be B3, and what foods am I going to eat to get B3 as an example. So an AI would be helping in that. And then sustainability, uh, I think, not just for the planet, but for the person. So I think these foods as medicines and sustainability, AI and uh, personalized health all going to weave together. So very exciting. Uh, As you say, this is kind of a, a 10 year outlook horizon, but we don't have stability. I mean, I just think of 10 years as like, at this point, an eternity. Um, can you give us maybe a three-year horizon? And this is unfair. She, this is, she had no, so you can say no, I cannot, and I won't. 
No, it's I, I, when I say 10 years, I think that these are going to be relevant topics for the next 10 years. Not that it's going to take 10 years to achieve meaningful, you know, um, achievements in these areas. Um, but for, you know, AI is already here today. It's already being used. Um, it's still early days and st still very early case studies, but there's a lot to be excited about and a lot to be encouraged around. Um, you know, with food as medicine, I think there's a, a, a movement underway where people are m increasingly understanding the relationship between food and their overall well-being um, and a desire to get away from medication and use food to help manage um, health conditions that they have. And, you know, we've seen even at, even at retailers, you know, they have more nutritionists on staff. They have people who are consulting. They're looking at food as medicine. Um, so, you know, there are things that are happening today, but I just think these are things that are going to be with us for a while. Ultimately, I, I think we might be saying that we're having a positive conversation in a world of maybe negative. When you tell me that more nutritionists are on staff, I'm over the moon about this since doctors under their very busy schedules usually get only four hours of nutrition in a four-year medical cycle and a four-year intern cycle. That's eight years of study and learning four years of nutrition. We all go to our doctor and say, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? Hey, you know, you should do this, that, and the other. But the truth is you need to be a bit more specific, a nutritionist, and hopefully AI might be that for you in, in the long run. We'll see. Now, as we kind of rope this in to get specific, we'll talk about plant-based innovation, and then we'll step out and talk about meat and dairy and plant-based innovation, how that all comes together. Uh, what are you seeing kind of coming out of Q4? Now, we've done all the earnings calls. Uh, what are you seeing? We, we've talked about Beyond Meat here, but, but maybe companies like um, IFF, Givaudan, Oatly, what are you seeing there? So when we, especially with starting with the ingredients companies, um, I think the good news is that we seem to have hit kind of the bottom of where they were going through customer destocking. There was some pressure there. Um, there were trends where you know their customers were slowing down their orders, um, and that's a supply chain related issue. Um, but the the good thing that we saw out of earnings this quarter is that it's starting to start to rebuild. Um, and these, these companies are, are very heavily invested in diversified protein and alternative protein, um, depending on what terminology you like to use. Um, and so even though we're still seeing slower sales at retail, um, we're seeing positive signs out of the ingredients companies that demand is starting to come back to do some more innovation and to get some more um, traction um, with these bigger companies, package companies uh, that they serve. So that was really the positive coming out from the ingredients companies that we really see um, hopefully the beginning of what's going to rebuild in terms of innovation um, across the space. Um, for companies like Oatly, um, you know, I think... You, we're, we're seeing that all of the efforts they've taken in the last, you know, the last year and a half, um, and I know we talked about Beyond Meat before, but Beyond Meat falls in this category too, well. where they've done massive cost cutting, they've restructured their organizations, they've taken a hard look at their business, they've exited unprofitable product lines, um, you know, or, or geographies, um, and so they, they really seem to have hit the, the base from which they can now build. Um, and so, you know, we look at these companies and, and see that we think they're very well prepared now to actually move towards profitability, whereas before it was incredibly volatile. Um, and so every quarter it was, it was all over the place. And um, usually a new dream, which was not so realistic. We all just want to see the numbers. Exactly. Um, and so, but it feels like we've finally achieved some stability in the baseline operations. Um, and that is very, very encouraging as well. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. And so I have spoken a lot about Beyond Meat already on this show. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Oatly. I think that's really interesting. I want to say maybe nine months or a year ago, they decided to be capital um, in, infrastructure light, I'll say. So they got rid of owning a plant and leased it out to someone else. And now they just lease out the manufacturing capacity that they need. They've made some other changes um, structurally to be more on the path towards profitability. And they too, just like Beyond Meat, in Europe showing some really nice signs of uptick there in, in consumer demand, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so as we look at those ingredient companies that are, we always talk about this at VegTech Investor 
we really think the growth is going to happen in the supply chain. And that's that, you know, picks and shovels of the industry is really where the money to be made is. And um, I, I concur with you that the ingredient companies are looking towards innovation, thinking about R&D, doing some CapEx spend. That's very exciting to see. That should play out later in the marketplace. Um, but what about um, like flavor texture companies? Anything in there? IFF, Givaudan, anything interesting there? Um, so in, in terms of flavor and texture, um, uh, there's the nice thing is that, as you said, R&D is upticking. So there's investment behind R&D. Um, they're, they're, they're coming up with new compounds that just enhance the texture and the flavor of food. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can only be good news for the plant-based industry mm-hmm. um, because that has been one of the largest criticisms leveled at it is that the texture isn't quite you know, right, or the, t- the flavor profile needs to improve for some products, not all. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so again, just seeing that spirit of innovation, you know, um, it's nice to see that the management teams are going back to investing behind R&D. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, and, and the other part is that the supply chain is, is, is now stable enough that it's really unlocking the ability for these companies to go back and start reinvesting. Mm-hmm. We even had a conversation because Jen was kind enough to invite me to a one-on-one panel discussion on um, the industry. And we had this conversation that, you know, there was stupid money out there before investing in anything, an idea even with no intended even path to profitability. And I always think that makes for a bad founder and a bad CEO and that tight money times forces one to be crafty. And that really makes the better CEO. So in a way, I'm not sad about or I'm not upset by the contraction of investment from VCs, etc. Um, but we had a conversation ourselves about what is going to bring consumer demand back. And I would love to hear your thoughts. So when it, when it comes to consumer demand, um, it's, it's, it's always a little bit of a cart and a horse sort of thing. Um, but the biggest thing, and this is something we've talked about in the past, is price. Um, the products have to be affordable. Um, and right now, we're still in an environment where we still have persistent inflation. It is getting better. It is coming down in the food category. Um, but we're seeing that it's actually coming down slower in plant-based than it is in conventional protein. And a lot of that has to do with scale. Um, these smaller companies um, might have fabulous products, but they can't absorb costs as easily as a big company. Um, and so when you're talking about the prices coming down and in, in in, in, as inflation you know, subsides, you know, the big companies are, are able to bring it down faster because even if their costs are still higher, they can absorb it from other parts of their organization. Right these smaller companies don't have that same kind of capability. And so the price gap between the plant-based and the traditional or conventional products is still quite, quite wide. Um, and so bringing that price into closer to, you know, maybe not parity, but at least a little bit further down so that your typical family can afford to go back into the category is one big thing. Um, and then it's also about um, new uh, iterations of products you know, and, and getting people to, to try them. And so we're finally back in an environment at retail, for example, where they can do sampling, you know, That's that was gone for years, right? Where you could go What's sampling? Store. I mean, I had forgotten. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But the, so there are strategies at retail that, that can now come back into play, that can get people excited about you know, the products and the categories. Um, and I know like every time my husband goes to Costco, he tries something and he comes home with something new. So like yes. sampling, sampling is a simple strategy, but it's one example of those are the kinds of things that can help get consumers, you know, re-engaged with the category and to help it start to grow again. Mm-hmm. That's why sometimes when folks say, oh my gosh, I cannot afford this, I say, well, head to Gardein, owned by ConAgra, obviously a very large company. So when you're in the frozen aisle, head to something like Morningstar Burgers or Gardein, because they're going to be able to keep those prices lower than, let's say, the Beyond Meats or the Impossibles or the others. There are many other uh, other startups. Um, and that way you can get your toe into that meatless Monday if you know, you'd like to bring down things like cholesterol or you'd like to add some fiber into that diet. You know, get some some cleaner proteins in there for yourself. There, there are ways and prices will continue to come down. Um, let me give you an example of something I feel I have mixed results or feelings on this. So when I think of crab, mm-hmm. off the charts expensive. So imitation crab, mm-hmm. it's not even a discussion anymore. Imitation crab is in most California rolls, even at, at 
restaurants, maybe not high-end restaurants, but your average sushi restaurant, the California roll is made with imitation crab. It's about, give or take off the top of my head, one-third of real crab, which can be in the 30s per pound. And I think imitation crabs, no quotes here, but is about maybe $9 a pound, something like this. Now, I too would probably have real crab rather than imitation crab, but I don't even attempt to buy it. Um, I'm hoping for better innovation on taste and texture than imitation crab. I'm thinking, you know, imitation crab is like from the 1970s, folks. I think we can do better, but it's a great example of mass adoption based on price. What do you think? Um, I would agree with you. I think that's a great example. Um, I, margarine is the other example, right? right? Um, mass adoption, it's plant-based, um, and it was a cheaper alternative to butter. Um, and so, you know, um, people, you know, people think plant-based, these, like currently I find that a lot of people consider plant-based to be just about meat replacements or, you know, or, you know, especially that category when it's just so much broader than that. Um, but I would agree that there's opportunity for products like, you know, alternate, like, um, crab, uh, where there's some low hanging fruit that somebody should be able to jump on. Um, and with the improvements in texture and taste that we've seen coming out of the ingredients companies all the way into the packaged food companies, um, it does seem like a good opportunity. Yeah. And just kind of going back to the ingredients portion of this, I think a star for the ingredient companies is going to be protein powder. As we look to get more protein into everything, like why can't your cookie have some protein, for example? Why won't those chips have some protein? Why can't uh, your plant-based milks even have higher protein, et cetera? So, or your, your um, uh, monster beverages, that kind of thing. Uh, the sports drinks, why can't those have even more protein? So I think protein powders is kind of less confrontational than the meat at the center of your plate and still finding a way to get those clean proteins and this sector um, back into a way that people start trying it. And then that's the... Um, these uh, uh, the gateway drug <laughs> to getting people to try things so i'm um, very exciting okay so we had a panel together which was exciting you presented on um packaged foods in general you also had a panel with the uh, representative from the swine industry and a representative of the cattle industry and your own bloomberg's intelligence representative on the chicken industry mm -hmm. and I talk about this a lot, but I was interested to hear it from those who live it daily. The math doesn't work, as far as I can tell. The, from their mouths, I am um, paraphrasing, but any volatility with weather, any breakout of we just had someone, um, a human, catch the bird flu via a dairy cow yesterday came in the news, or two days ago came in the news uh, in, from Texas. Um, so you've pandemic risk, antibiotic resistance risk, uh, the damage into water inflows and the EPA uh, forcing stricter regulation on water, ammonia in the air, particularly for large chicken farms. This is a huge societal concern and currently a cost that the taxpayer bears. They won't always bear that cost though. This is a materiality issue to the bottom line. It's a financial risk to those balance sheets. This goes on and on. Greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation risk. I just don't know how to make that math work anymore. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, you know, what I'll say is that um, for conventional protein, it goes in cycles. Mm. So there are times when they're highly, highly profitable. Um, and there are times when they're not so profitable. And poultry is a good example where for the last several quarters, it just hasn't, the margins have been negative. Um, and so there are so many factors, as you said, that go into the raising of animals. It's the weather, it's the feed costs, it's the, 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 the care for the animals. There, there are so many factors that go in and any one of them um, can throw off you know, the entire production cycle. Um, and so you know, I, one of the challenges I think that these industries are facing um, is that they're not just producing, I'm going to use chicken as an example, they're not just using, they're not producing chicken just to sell chicken, it's that they have to produce chicken that meets a certain very specific specification, that the chicken has to be between 4.9 and 5.1 pounds. Uh, like and that and, and it and it's such a tight spec you know it's so tight that if something happens to disrupt it um, that entire flock of chickens they have to figure out what to do with um, and so part of the issue is is the end use you know where it's so tight that they don't just say we need chicken 
right? They say we need chicken that meets these criteria. And that's really changed the industry quite a bit. But when it comes to the, to the math, it's becoming harder and harder to be sustainably profitable running some of these businesses because there are so many of these factors in play. So it, it's about one of the things we've seen of these big, bigger companies is just diversification. Um, and this is part of how they're trying to stabilize their overall earnings. So you look at Tyson, they call themselves a protein company. You know, um, Cargill calls itself a protein company. Um, and, you know, they've added, you know, more diversity in terms of the proteins that they're, that they're producing um, to try to stabilize those earnings. Um, but it is a challenge for the industry and, and there's no clear, easy way uh, answer um, other than investing in ways to diversify, um, investing in other areas where there could be good long-term margin potential and sales potential um, with the understanding it may take a little time to, to get to where it has a meaningful impact on the entire company. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing coming out of this conference that was underscored for me is that volatility is here to stay. Volatility in the world as we know it, there's really no going back. I know we all have sort of gone back after COVID, but um, extreme weather will persist and uncertain political times will persist and we remain at risk I would say, given our food supply system and the United Nations agrees with me, top three reasons for the next pandemic, all related to eating meat, with the top two being uh, due to the intensification of animal factories. So our, our food system globally playing a large role in keeping us at risk from pandemics and disease. And this is a stressful, volatile world. So I think those um, supply chains will remain, or cost of goods sold will remain at um risk for the meat companies, but they do seem open to protein diversification, which is how I always refer to alternative proteins, plant-based innovation. Uh, So summing up, Jen and I were on a panel. She invited me at the last minute. I didn't know any of the questions. Everyone on the panel knew all the questions ahead. I was like, it's okay, I'll do it. I'm I'm down. Uh, And I was with the, the a representative of cattle association and of the swine industry and i found them to be very frank about how tough their business is and open to protein diversification what did you think yeah i think i you know i think that there are things to be encouraged about because i've always looked at this space as an and mm-hmm. you know it's a yes and right so you know um, alternative protein is a yes and to conventional protein we are light years from where alternative protein will be a bigger portion of what everybody, uh, you know, of the world's food supply than conventional protein. Mm -hmm. It may happen, but we're still a long time away. Um, So what I found really encouraging is that, you know, the, the traditional protein industries are open to listening um, that you're seeing, you know, you're seeing them consider new ways of maybe incorporating alternative protein in things, ways that I hadn't thought about, whether it's in terms of feed additives or, you know, byproducts or however they may be able to do something. So I think that's encouraging that at least the minds are open. Um, and it seemed, it seems maybe a little less confrontational than historically it has been. Um, the other thing that I thought, you know, I want to make sure that we give some credit is that there have been a lot of efforts to make their current operations more sustainable or more environmentally friendly. They are still the biggest contributors to our problems. Mm-hmm. But um, I actually was surprised at, at how, how much efficiency they've been able to actually achieve so far. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that we should all, you know, say, you know, congratulate them on progress that they're making mm-hmm. because it takes a lot of little steps mm-hmm. to, to get to where we need to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and every step counts. And so that to me was part of what was most illuminating was the willingness to engage. But also, um, I think I underappreciated some of the effort that they've been taking to, to reduce their impact on the planet right now. Yes. Yes. What, what worries me there from a long-term perspective is Again, this volatility, we don't really know what we don't know. So we don't know the next thing that's coming our way that's going to disrupt everything. And what we did see during COVID is that a long food supply chain, long cost of goods equation, so that would be the the current meat industry where you, for example, cut down trees, deforestation, biodiversity loss, to grow crops, 
crops that have food and protein, do you give that food to people? No, you give it to animals and they need land, water, time. Uh, a cow needs a year and a half. So you're going to have to cut down more trees, start the cycle again. And then you're transporting, uh, you know, we were talking here, you transport cattle to feed in Canada or Mexico, and then you transport them back to this cattle, like a thousand pounds, you know, transport it back to the United States to, to slaughter. It's, you know, all these energy costs. This is why a Beyond Meat burger, but any kind of plant burger is going to use 99, excuse me, 97% less land, 97% less water, 90% fewer greenhouse gas emissions, 30%, 37% less energy. So I, I love that they have, and a hundred percent, they have made great strides mm-hmm. and they're taking it seriously. I'm talking about the current protein industry, meat industry, taking it very seriously. But I worry that Band-Aid, you know, once you plug one hole in a sinking boat, you just have to go plug another hole That's and true. their list is so long. I, I'm saying true. this compassionately. Uh, they, I don't know. I don't know how you fix the math. There are too many holes in the sinking boat. I would agree. There, there are a lot of places that you have to plug, yeah. um, uh, and it is, it is a, it is a, I think an ongoing challenge that just isn't going to go away. No. Um, yeah. You know, um, the good news, um, people are, people are working at it. Um, so you know, hopefully, hopefully, you know, we find better, longer-term patches for those holes in the boat. Yeah. Um, and it, it, but it's going to take people working together, and it's, it's, yeah. it's. I don't think anyone can achieve what we need to achieve by being in a silo. Um, and so the idea that there's openness to having, you know, have discussion, have engagement, understanding where alternative proteins can f- help fill some of those gaps, can help, so, you know, stabilize supply chains, transform the food system. Um, but nothing can happen in a silo. So I, I think one of the big takeaways for me is just that um, being able to have a panel where we have the beef association, we have someone who understands the poultry industry, the the, the pork industry, and then alternative protein all together um, is a great step forward to having that ongoing conversation of of working in a complementary way instead of a confrontational way. I thought the audience was a little stunned. So I was a last minute addition and I think the audience didn't quite know what to make of it. I had people pull me aside at the end and say things like, Wow, brave of you to be on stage with the cattle and pork industry. Uh, I, I must admit I was a tad nervous. I didn't know how it would go, but I was complimentary again, really amazed at the openness. And I think that's where real innovation comes from. Absolutely. And it's, it's you know, innovation comes from conversation. Um, and so the more that um, different groups can engage, the more creativity, the more brain power there is. Um, and you've got people who have different areas of expertise. And when you start to combine them in different ways, amazing things can happen. Mm-hmm. So hopefully this is only a sign of good things to come. Yeah, it was very exciting. I'll, I'll sort of end by saying Kenneth Zuckerberg from CH Research, if I have that right. He talked a lot about national security and how food insecurity is a national security uh, interest as well as innovation being a national security interest. No one wants to be in the back of the bus on food innovation. It, you know, when you think about China, Israel, Singapore, Netherlands, Germany, all investing heavily in diversified proteins, not for the reasons you might think, oh, animals or the planet, but for a stable food supply to their people. We saw during COVID how food supplies fell apart because they're uh, fragile and um, too long. A long food supply chain makes you very um, fragile and we all seek to be anti-fragile. So I thought that was interesting as, as we talked about, you know, there's just too many holes to plug and we're going to have to plug them. And so we had this great conversation yesterday with real openness about the progress of the pork and chicken and meat industry, but also the acknowledgement that there's probably room to let in, work with, innovate on diversified proteins for a better balance sheet in the end. Food security, food supply, and a better balance sheet. Um, might you have any parting words before we go get coffee? <laughs> um, you know, I think what you just said in terms of, you know, food security, um, we still need to see more investment in the space, yes. right? Um, so food security, I, I, that's where you get government, you know, support coming in. Um, and you're, you're seeing it in in countries where there's less there's less domestic production we need to see it in all countries um, and so just the idea that more more people acknowledge that food security is a national type security issue um, that we really do need to continue to all work to transform the food supply chain um, 
it just it, it's 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 nice to see people across so many different sectors and segments all looking at the same thing coming to the same conclusion yes exactly whereas a year ago they did not they were not on the same team it's it's incredible progress in a very short amount of time it is incredible progress in a short amount of time for investors out there i'll leave you with this according to the world bank food tech is now climate tech and they are anticipating that food tech is going to get 300 to 500 billion investment each year for the next 10 to 15 years that's a wonderful investment opportunity for investors and it's going to come from blended capital that means philanthropic capital Maybe you saw that Jeff Bezos is committing a billion dollars to food systems transformation, starting with the first drop of 60 million for R&D on taste and texture and price reduction. That, uh, I'll have a, an episode on that coming very soon. So um, philanthropic uh, investment, uh, government investment, VC investment, which is tapered off a little bit, and Wall Street investment. That would be you, everyone. Wall Street investment. So their anticipation that uh, there's going to be an inflow of capital, food tech is climate tech, helping you bring down your carbon footprint for your portfolio, investment portfolio. And I think this is going to be Oddly, I'll end on a happy note, a very exciting time where there is innovation, there is job growth, there is wealth growth, and uh, a a brighter spirit maybe, so in a more stable society. So I look towards that in a volatile world. You? Absolutely. I'm 100% with you, Elizabeth. Okay, we're on to coffee, folks. Thanks for being with us this morning. This has been wonderful. I thank my guest, Jen Bartash, a senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, covering big box stores and the food industry. She was kind enough to not only have me on a diversified proteins panel for a one-on-one kind of fireside chat, but also to include me with the cattle industry and the pork industry on a, I guess I can call it diversified proteins because it's it's uh, meat protein and alternative proteins together for a very interesting panel. And this has been a very interesting con- conference. And thank you, Bloomberg Intelligence, for having us at the Farm, Food, and Fuel Summit. Have a great day, everybody.